first of all, loved growing up in Chicago. I mean, it's an amazing city in that it has all the offerings of a very big city, and yet it feels like a town sometimes because, um, you know, people generally don't leave their neighborhoods that much. So the neighborhoods are very delineated. But if you, you know, if you want to go to a fantastic museum, you can. If you want to go to a great play, you know, among the greatest in the world, if not the greatest, then you can go to a great play. I, when I was a girl, I used to uh, usher, volunteer usher at the Steppenwolf Theater. So I got to see all these amazing plays and all these amazing actors for free, you know. And, and I loved being in the city. Uh, but when I was 18, I knew that it was really important to leave the city and go make my own life. When I was a girl, though, growing up, my best friends were Paige and Daryl Hannah. Oh, and wow. so I would go with them to audition sometimes. And I thought, as I was thinking about how am I going to pay for college, this acting, modeling thing seemed like it might be a really good way to help pay for college because I knew that my mom could never afford the tuition. And uh, so I really loved acting. I didn't really think that anybody would maybe pay me for it, but <laughs> I got an agent after I was an extra, a special extra in a film called My Bodyguard. Uh, and that came through an acting teacher who had recommended me um, to go to this interview with Tony Bill, who is the director, who became a dear friend. And, um, and then it all just kind of started from there. Wow. Did that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It makes perfect sense. And I like how all those things sort of feed into this one natural path. Don't yes. They? Well, I was saying to somebody earlier, there is no unwasted effort. There's no unwasted effort. It will all add to the path. It will all add to the journey. Somehow, oh, you just can't even imagine how it will. But you just need to do things fully to the best of your ability. And with your heart and heart. Yes, yes. And you go towards the thing that you love, what you love to do. You know, and I think that's why, I mean, I loved acting, but after Flashdance, it was really important for me to go back to school because at that time, that was the thing that I really loved and it was really important for me to explore that because that had been a goal for so long. Yeah. Well, the L word, when I first met with Eileen Chaikin, you know, I asked if she was going to make the character biracial and she said she wasn't sure, she hadn't considered it and I, I asked her if she could think about that because I thought it would be an interesting um, way to discuss race along mm. with gender and, and sexual orientation. Uh, and then with the Chicago Code, I just asked Sean, you know, what is her background? Just so I know, so I could, because that will inform certain choices, even in a subtle way. And, and they decided to make her biracial, which I think will be interesting. Um, again, an interesting way to talk about uh, race. And um, I think, so I haven't necessarily gravitated towards that. It's just come up in the formulation of the character. But certainly it's, you know, interesting to play someone who has their own kind of personal power and they have to use that personal power in a realm that isn't necessarily accepting of them yeah. to kind of make some sort of shift. But she's so uh, focused on her purpose and so powerful inside that those things are irrelevant at a certain yeah. point during the day. Like you have to get this job done also because the clock is ticking. You don't know, she doesn't know when she's going to be out of the job. So she's trying to accomplish as much as she can with the short amount of time that she may have. And so she, because she's on this sort of righteous path for better or for worse, um, she's not really concerned with how people view her only in, in terms of how it affects her politically, mm -hmm. you know, because she knows that she has all of the officer's best interests at heart. So uprooting the corruption in the department is going to help all of those officers who are not corrupt. Yeah. And that is much more important to her than, than pissing off the corrupt officers. Yeah. She's really fighting for the good guys, isn't she? Yeah, she's trying to keep everybody safe, and she's trying to get the job done. And you can't keep everybody safe if you've got corrupt cops on the street.
because the, then the people on the street don't have your back. There's no respect for the police department. So I think she really wants to um, reinstate respect for a police officer. I mean, when I was a young woman, we had respect for the police. Yeah, you know, well, in England it was very much the, you know, the bobby on the, the bicycle, the village, village police. Yeah, and that's the person you went to for help or, yeah. you know, but going on ride-alongs with the officers now, my God, the kids don't respect the police at all. It's, it's fascinating. I don't, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's really, really fascinating. And I understand. They probably have had some horrible incident with some corrupt cop. Um, you know, maybe their father has been put away. Maybe their mother has been put away. Whatever. So they don't have this um, kind of feeling. So I think she really wants to uh, reinstate some kind of ethical code yeah. within her own department. You know, because by and large, most officers are amazing and are very big-hearted and and are really affected by the things that they see. So she has to be really careful that with all this virtuousness mm -hmm. that it isn't her downfall in a way. Yeah. Because you, can, there, there, you run the risk of by being so moralistic that you don't see other people's point of view, that you lose your empathy. Yeah. And, and so I think that's really important that she see the other side. But then there's the whole other discussion about, you know, as a woman, what kind of leader are you? Yeah. Especially, you know, you're, you're in charge of ostensibly eight to 10,000 primarily men in what is almost a paramilitaristic force. And how, what does that leadership look like? You know, are you an authoritarian leader? Are you inclusive? Do you share information? Do you not share information? Um, because if your leadership looks too feminine, you know, stereotypically or too soft, you could be perceived as weak. And yet, she can't just go out drinking with the guys like she used to, yeah. because that could be perceived as being overly sexual, which is a weakness, you know, because women are so often just um, sort of segregated to their sexuality and how they, how they appear, yeah. you know. You in fact, there's a lot of yeah. talk, even, even now, I mean, I think most jobs this is true. And this is not just true in the Chicago Police Department. This is also true in the boardrooms. This is also true among actors. That, you know, oftentimes people will say, like, when a woman rises to power, they ask, who did she sleep with? You know, that it couldn't possibly be about her acumen. Mm -hmm. It couldn't possibly be about her intelligence. You know, it's got to be about her body, because that's how, you know, women get ahead. And when you look at just even um, Halloween costumes for oh, young so girls. Or even any fancy dress party, it's always aimed at the woman being either, you know, scantily clad. Yes, but, but, but this starts at like the age of three. These costumes start where they'll have some little baby, like literally Bounties. for a newborn, like yeah. beyond. Like short little mini skirt for a kid who can't, a girl who can't even walk, and then put little high heels on them. But beyond that, even getting to like costumes for four and five year olds, that you have the, the choice of like a nurse, mm -hmm. um, the megastar who has like a little midriff showing thing and you know sparkles, um, or what would the other one be? Maybe a witch. Yeah. And and the guys can have tycoon, they can have police officer, they can have doctor. They have all of these Cowboy. things that are you know um, somehow it's very okay, much but yeah it's too absolutely. Yeah, and there, so this sort of gender um, stereotyping starts so early. Um, so who do you think of when you're when you're channeling that to, to be this strong leader? Is there other people that you have in mind, or do you just I sometimes go to mythology. You know, I think of Durga. You know, I think of. I don't know if you're familiar with the story. Can I do a twenty second timeout? You guys, we can hear you. We love you, but we can hear you. Thanks. Oh, maybe that's their way of saying, stop, we're going to start talking louder. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Durga. Is this a Greek? Um, Indian. Indian, okay. Indian, Indian goddess. And, you know, the heaven and earth are out of balance, and the demons have taken over uh, the world, and, and the gods have not been able to fight the demons. And the king of the demons comes to Durga, and he tells, he sends a messenger who says, they, uh, his, his boss, the king of the demons, wants to marry her, and won't that be so wonderful, because then she'll get to be the queen of the universe. And she, you know, batting her eyelids, says, 
oh, I'm so sorry, but I promised myself long ago that I would only marry someone who was as strong as I am. Oh, so yeah. I will, I will meet you. I, you know, if he was willing to meet me on the battlefield, then you know that's what we'll do. And then the king of the demons is so outraged that he sends various armies to come and kill her, and she defeats these armies. And at one point, he sends an army that is so extensive that she. Um, manifests seven other goddesses, but one of whom is Kali, who has a long tongue and three eyes and is blue and looks like a demon herself, and she has a mala made of skulls. And, uh, and finally, the king of the demons is forced to face her in the battlefield, and he says to her, oh, you need all of these other goddesses to help you fight. He goes, you have to fight me on your own. And she says, you fool all of these other goddesses' army. Oh. And she whoosh, puts them all back inside her, and then she defeats him. Wow. It's really exciting. That's fantastic. Isn't that a good story? I think I've seen that one yeah. as soon as I get back to my <laughs> Yeah, it's really, I'm, I'm completely shortening the story. There's all kinds of fantastic things that happen. Um, but it's the mistaken nature, first of all, that a woman who is pleasing to the eye cannot be fearsome. Yeah because we are many things.